Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, today I will be presenting about uh, the recent updates regarding pregnancy in MS. And if we have some time, we'll discuss a little bit about the issue of breastfeeding. These are my disclosures. So this is the latest statistics uh, about MS in the world. This was the uh, World MS Atlas just published a few weeks ago showing that MS is now affecting up to 2.8 million persons in the world. Uh, almost 75% of those are females and the average age as diagnosis is 30. So basically most of our patients with MS are gonna be young, female in the childbearing age. And this is why the issue of pregnancy and MS is becoming more and more important to address. We did our recent study managing the Minactrim's uh, data. We looked at almost 7,000 patients from our MENA region. And again, we saw the same thing. Almost 72% of our patients are female, which is comparable to the rest of the world. So almost three quarter of our patients are gonna be females and most of them in the childbearing age. MS patients are getting more and more pregnant. They are more prone to get pregnant now. And this is a nice study from the US showing in green, the general population women. And we can see how the pregnancy rate is going down with time between 2006 and 2014. So women in the West are getting less and less pregnant. While women with MS in blue, and we can see here how the rate of pregnancy is increasing. So more and more women with MS <clears throat> are prone to become pregnant because we are quite advanced now in managing MS and we are able to control the disease much better. So our women with MS are much healthier and feel well in getting pregnant. So when you choose a DMT uh, for our patients, I think it's very, very important to think of pregnancy planning from the beginning, from the time you choose your disease-modifying therapy, so as not to run into problems later. For example, a young patient who wants to get pregnant, choosing at that point in time in a treatment-naive patient a medication that is not compatible with pregnancy is going to create problems later on. You'll have to stop it, withdraw it. The patient might not get pregnant immediately. We might run into relapses. So it's going to be a problem. So I really recommend starting thinking about family planning from the minute the woman comes to you with the first symptoms and starting treatment. <clears throat> now, how does uh, pregnancy affect the disease course in MS? I think this is the first point we have to address before thinking about anything else. The old concept was the concept that was presented by Confavreux through the PRIMS trials in 1998. We're talking about almost uh, 25 years ago. And basically that the relapse rate, which is here before pregnancy, drops during pregnancy by around 70%. And in the postpartum period increased by around 70%. So even higher than the pre-pregnancy rate and stays high for around three to six months. So during pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, only 5% of the patient relapse, while in the postpartum period, almost one third of the patients can relapse. So this was the concept that was carried out. But remember, this is 1998. Most of the patients in the PRIM trial were on no treatment or in azathioprine, meaning we didn't even have the interferons widely used by them. So this is a different population from our current population of women with MS, where now we have high efficacy medication that can control the disease. At that point in time, because of the poor control of the disease and lack of medication, most of the patients had advanced disability quickly within the first few years. So the women that used to get pregnant are the women really that had mild disease, while patients with severe disease were disabled and not prone to get pregnant. While nowadays with our high efficacy medication, and now that we are able to control this highly active disease, those women now are able to get pregnant. So it's a different population. So there is a new concept about the effect of pregnancy on disease course, which we actually were part of the people that advanced it last year. This is our publication from the MENA region in collaboration between Lebanon and Kuwait. We looked at a total of 164 pregnancies. And for the first time, we had patients that were on actually the current therapies. 46% were on interferons, 20% on fingolimod, and another 19% on natalizumab. 
And what we looked at the relapse rate, the pre-pregnancy relapse rate was 0, 0.1, the annualized relapse rate. And actually during pregnancy, it doubled. It went up to 0, 0.20. So rather than decreasing like the PRIMS trial, it actually increased. Looking at which medications these women were on, the women that were on interferon beta, their pre-pregnancy relapse rate actually decreased, just like the PRIMS trial. And remember, the ones that were on interferon were probably patients with mild disease, well-controlled interferon beta. But the patients that were on the high-efficacy medication, fingolimod and natalizumab, and look at the relapse rate, almost zero before pregnancy, and it increased significantly, 0.29 and 0.22, which was highly statistically significant. So most of this increase in the relapse rate during pregnancy was due to withdrawal of these high efficacy medications in patients that had highly active disease. And this is really the new uh, concept that we are introducing now. And when we looked at the predictors of this relapse during pregnancy, was it that the patient had highly disease activity? No, their EDSS score was similar. Was it that they were highly active? Of course not. They were almost had zero relapse rate in the preceding year because they were on highly efficacy medication. The main predictor of this relapse was the washout period. When we stopped the medication for a long time, like nine weeks here, almost two months, this is what induced the relapses, as opposed to a very short washout period of a mean of 2.5 weeks, <clears throat> and this decreased the relapses. So high efficacy medications, specifically fingolimod, and natalizumab, <clears throat> which are known to produce a rebound activity when withdrawn, if they are stopped with a long washout period, then the, uh, the relapse rate might actually increase uh, during pregnancy. So this is really now the new concept. And this was also confirmed by the Italian group. They looked at natalizumab and they showed exactly the same thing, that patient on uh, disease-modifying therapy injectables or no treatment, the green line, Actually, the relapse rate did drop during pregnancy and increased postpartum, exactly like the PRIMS curve. However, patient on natalizumab had a significant increase in relapse rate during pregnancy, just like our patient. And when they looked at the washout period, the black line here are the natalizumab that had no washout period. And we can see that the black line follows, again, the typical curve of the PRIMS while the patient on natalizumab that had a long washout period are the ones that had a high relapse rate during pregnancy. So again, the Italian group confirming the result from the MENA region, introducing this new concept about pregnancy and high uh, disease, uh, high efficacy disease mod uh, treatment. And remember, these are the high efficacy disease modifying therapies that are taken continuously, like fingolimod and natalizumab. What are the predictor of postpartum relapses? When you want to discuss with your patient, how, what's the risk of having relapses in the postpartum? The most important predictor is how active is the disease in the year preceding the pregnancy. So patients that have high disability in the year preceding this, uh, pregnancy, patients that have relapses in the year preceding pregnancy, patients that were on no treatment in the year preceding pregnancy, these are the patients that are at high risk for postpartum relapse. So our recommendation always for a woman that wants to get pregnant is to have a disease under control for at least one year, no relapses, no disability progression on treatment, and then try to get pregnant. So how do we approach disease-modifying therapy in pregnancy? Which ones are safe, which ones are not? Now, the problem with pregnancy <clears throat> that 50% of our pregnancies are unplanned. So you have to make sure then that when you're dealing with a patient in the childbearing age with a potential to get pregnant, that this patient should be on a treatment that is compatible. <clears throat> Steroids can be used during pregnancy for relapses. There is a small risk of teratogenesis in the first three months, but recent data has shown that this is probably not the case. Uh, uh, it's better to use methylprednisolone or prednisone, which is what we use in relapses, because only 10% of the dose crosses the placenta. Do not use dexamethasone or betamethasone because it crosses the placenta at 100%. So using a course of solimedrol or IV methylprednisolone during a relapse is probably safe during pregnancy. Interferons are also safe during pregnancy. This is the European Interferon Registry and showing that, remember, the, uh, the incidence of congenital anomalies in the general population is around 4%. 
So in the interferon registry, looking at almost a thousand patients, the rate of congenital anomaly was only 1.8%, so within the general population rate. Another registry with almost 3,000 patients from the Nordic Scandinavian countries again showed the same thing, a very low congenital anomaly rate of around 1.8% and a uh, spontaneous abortion rate, which is around 8%, and the general population, it's up to 20%. So these studies have shown that the interferon are actually quite safe to use it during pregnancy. And remember, the general axiom now is that you have to have data on 1,000 pregnancies exposed to a disease-modifying therapy before you decide on a label change. So the interferon fulfilled this criterion, and this is why the EMA actually changed the label of the interferon, allowing them to be used during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. And this is extremely important because of the postpartum relapses and we have a problem because women want to breastfeed. So we have a problem of stopping the disease-modifying therapy for breastfeeding. Now we have the option that they can breastfeed and start immediately the disease-modifying therapy, the interferon in that case. The uh, dimethylfumarate, this is the TEC registry, which is the uh, TEC Fidera pregnancy registry. We have almost 345 patients now in the registry. And again, Spontaneous abortion, 6% within general population. Birth defect is 3% within general population. So Tecfidera seems to be safe, but of course we still don't have the 1,000 cases yet like the interferon, so no label change yet. But remember also that the uh, dimethylfumarates, the monoethylfumarates were used in Germany for psoriasis for years and years, almost 15 years, 20 years by now. And the pregnancy registries from this, from this trial or from this experience also showed that dimethylfumarate was safe during pregnancy. Terflunomide, we know that it was teratogenic in animals, but it turns out it's not showing teratogenicities in a human. And this is the terflunomide pregnancy registry on 437 confirmed cases of whom 222 were actually exposed. And again, we're seeing a low congenital malformation rate, 3.6%, which is acceptable. And it seems that the enzyme that teriflunomide works on, which is a dihydroorotate dehydrogenase, which induces the decreased proliferation of the lymphocyte, actually is much more sensitive to the drug in rats and in mouses than in humans. So for a dose-to-dose -dose or gram-to-gram, teriflunomide is way more effective in rats and, uh, and mice compared to humans, almost 140 times more effective in rats than humans. And this probably explains why for the same dosing, we're seeing congenital anomalies in the animals, but not in humans. But of course, the label has not changed on terflumide, so we still try not to use it uh, during a pregnancy. Uh, Fingoli mode, of course, is, you know, is teratogenic, with a teratogenic risk of almost 6 to 7%, and this is why uh, there has been a warning from the EMA last year that it should not be used uh, during a pregnancy. So if you look at the three continuous oral therapy use, dimethylfumarate is probably the safest to use until the patient gets pregnant because our main issue always with women getting pregnant is stopping the uh, disease-modifying therapy ahead of time to, to wash out the treatment and then get the pregnancy. But sometimes the average time for those women to, preg to get pregnant is around six months. And around 20% of women above 30 take a year to get pregnant. So this is where we fall in the problem of not being on a disease-modifying therapy, waiting for the pregnancy to occur, and then incurring relapses and disease reactivation. So for us, dimethylfumarate is the oral therapy that we use until the patient gets pregnant. So we keep it until we get, the patient gets pregnant. We don't do that with terfluoride and fingolimod. Once the patient gets pregnant, we stop it. We have already the safety regarding pregnancy, and overall, and on top of that, dimethylfumarate uh, half-life is few hours. So once you stop it, it's cleared completely from the system within 24 hours, so another advantage. The natalizumab pregnancy registry, again, we have 316 uh, pregnancy exposed to natalizumab, 5% congenital anomalies, which is within the general population, and the EMA label says that the available literature do not suggest an effect of natalizumab exposure on pregnancy outcomes. So this is good because now you have a high-efficacy medication that you can use until the patient gets pregnant and not wash it out 
which we have shown in our trial and in the Italian trial that it is risky and can induce relapses during pregnancies. This is from the German MS and pregnancy registry. And actually they showed that if you use natalizumab in the third trimester, almost two thirds of the born infant might have some hematological anomalies, thrombocytopenia, anemia, but most of these actually were asymptomatic, just laboratory anomalies. But if you keep using the, the, uh, the natalizumab until week 30, then you completely suppress the postpartum and the pregnancy relapses almost pregnancy relapses and if you use it until week 34 probably you also suppress the postpartum relapses completely while if you stop it early in pregnancy we might have a risk of relapses during pregnancy and postpartum so what we're doing nowadays first we keep uh, natalizumab until the patient gets pregnant there is no washout period anymore if the patient was not very active before we keep uh, we keep her off treatment but if the patient had active disease before and we're worried about reactivation, we keep natalizumab until around week 30, 34, but we use an extended interval dosing of eight weeks. And studies have shown that the efficacy of natalizumab can be maintained until eight weeks. So this way we are uh, safe to control the relapses during pregnancy and the postpartum relapses. Alamtuzumab, remember, alamtuzumab and cladribine are used intermittently. They are immune reconstitution therapy. So they induce changes in the immune system, which are long lasting beyond the time when the drug is still uh, present in the serum. So alamtuzumab, one month after the infusions, is not uh, present in the serum at all, yet its efficacy persists. So when they looked at the natalizumab pregnancy registry, looking at 248 pregnancy, of course, the congenital anomaly rate was extremely low, 0.5%, because most of these pregnancies occur based on the recommendation four months from the last infusion when the drug was not present at all in the serum. So for alamtuzumab, four months after the infusion, first or second, it's quite safe to get pregnant. And for cladribine, we don't have pregnancy data yet on cladribine, but again, it's cleared completely from the system within a week. So the labels say that after six months of the last dose of cladribine, pregnancy is safe since the drug is not present in the serum. Ocrelizumab has been recently uh, uh, used in the MS armamentarium. We don't have too much pregnancy data yet on it. We have only 62 pregnancies exposed <coughs> to ocrelizumab, which means within three months of the drug. And if we look at these, again, we, we have seen um, in the 62 cases, one case of trisomy 21, so probably unrelated to the drug, and another case with multiple hereditary features. So in any case, <clears throat> the congenital anomaly rate is still in the range of one to 2%, which is also within the general population. But of course, we need more and more data on ocrelizumab. And remember, for ocrelizumab, it's used intermittently, so it's a, uh, injection every six months. And it's probably safe to get pregnant four months or six months, four to six months after the last dose because of the half-life of uh, ocrelizumab. It's usually completely cleared from the system within four and a half months. So this is finally uh, the pregnancy uh, consensus from the UK, which basically summarizes what I said. Uh, the injectable are safe during, to use during pregnancy. <clears throat> Teriflonamide and fingolamide, the two oral therapy, should not be used uh, during pregnancy. Dimethylfumarate, limited data in pregnancy, but as far as we are concerned, and in most centers in the world, <clears throat> we are keeping uh, dimethylfumarate until the pregnancy occurs, then we stop it. Natalizumab is safe to use during pregnancy and up to week 34, actually, in highly active patients. Ocrelizumab, uh, avoid pregnancy for 12 months, but the usual recommendation now is probably not more than six months. Alamtuzumab, they can get pregnant four months after the last infusion. Cladribine, they can get pregnant six months after the last infusion. So this is really the UK recommendation is a summary of all the data that I just presented. Now, because of that, and now that we are able to control the disease better, more and more women are getting pregnant while on the disease-modifying therapies without washout period. So if you look at this interesting graph, and this is a study I think was taken from the MS base, 
In 2006, <clears throat> only around 25% of women, which is in green, got pregnant while on disease-modifying therapy, while the remaining in blue had a washout period. So this percentage kept increasing, and in 2016, almost 60% of the patients now are getting pregnant while on the disease-modifying therapy, a major change in our approach to pregnancy and disease-modifying therapy based on all the recent data and the safety data that we have accumulated. So breastfeeding and MS. <clears throat> Now, the WHO says that exclusive breastfeeding is recommended up to six months of age with continued breastfeeding along with appropriate complementary foods up to two years of age or beyond. Breastfeeding is good for the fetus. It gives the fetus immunity and nutrition, and it's good for the mother decreasing the risk of the metabolic syndrome. So if we are able to have our woman with MS breastfeed, we should because it's quite helpful. So the problem is, if they are going to breastfeed and we have to stop the disease modifying therapies to avoid the transfer to the baby, then we are in the dilemma of weighing the risk of stopping the disease modifying therapy, especially in the postpartum period when we have a high risk of relapse versus the benefit of breastfeeding to the baby. So this is the issue that we don't discuss. Hello. Of course, this issue has been resolved now with the interferons. The EMA label, as I mentioned, has changed, and now you can start breastfeeding along with resuming the interferons immediately, and that's a major advantage. So the initial study that showed that breastfeeding is protective in MS was the study by Langergold. And in that study, they showed that patients that were on exclusive breastfeeding, so only breastfeeding without the bottle at all, 36% only relapsed, as opposed to 87% that did not have the exclusive breastfeeding. So a huge difference, and it seems that exclusive breastfeeding was quite protective against postpartum relapse. However, it turns out that patients that actually breastfed immediately because they wanted to resume their disease-modifying therapy, where they were women, that had highly active disease and they were worried about stopping their treatment. And those women actually had a higher likelihood of relapsing at the postpartum. While the patient with a mild course are the ones that actually decided to breastfeed and not resume the therapy. So this was a little bit biased actually as far as data. When the Italian group looked at the same data, again, the non-breastfeeding group in uh, blue and the breastfeeding group in green, they found the same thing. The breastfeeding, the, non, the, the group that did not breastfeed had a much higher relapse postpartum than the group that actually had exclusive breastfeeding. However, when they controlled for the disease severity, which is the pre-pregnancy relapses, this effect was gone. So actually confirming that there was a bias <clears throat> in the previous trial, that patient that had a mild disease actually were the one that more likely to actually breastfeed and stop the disease modifying therapy. So until today, I think still this issue is controversial. And this is the MSJ, MSJ journal recently showing that <clears throat> it's still a controversial issue versus no or yes, can exclusive breastfeeding prevent postpartum relapses? So the conclusion from all of that is that exclusive breastfeeding is obviously very useful to the mother and the infant and is possibly associated with a protective effect in postpartum relapse rate. However, breastfeeding delays the anterior introduction, except for what we talked about right now, which are the interferons. So we have to weigh the risk. Predictors of postpartum relapses and current clinical studies should influence the decision of breastfeed or not. What does that mean? It means that a patient that is very highly active before pregnancy is the one that I would think more of avoiding breastfeeding and resuming treatment. While a patient that had a rather mild disease is the patient where I think more about stopping the disease-modifying therapy or keeping interferons and allowing breastfeeding. So you should weigh every case on its own. Two uh, points that are very important. In a patient that is breastfeeding, if you want to have a gadolinium-enhanced MRI, there should be a 24 washout period where the woman cannot breastfeed until the gut is washed out completely. And if you give steroids intravenously for a relapse, again, there should be a six hours after the last steroid injection to avoid breastfeeding, to not to allow the steroids to pass through the milk. 
However, even with breastfeeding, again, the concept, just like pregnancy, are changing. And this is a very nice study from California, uh, uh, presented, I think, uh, last year during the ECTRM. And it showed that actually most of our disease-modifying therapies are large molecules that do not go through the breast milk. And if they do go, most of them are taken either as injection IV or subcutaneous. And therefore, when they go, this very low quantity that goes through the breast milk into the gut of the infant is going to be mostly destroyed by the gastric acids of the infants because it cannot be used orally. It has to be used intravenously. So, for example, when they looked at interferon beta, the dose of interferon in the breast milk was actually 0.0006% of the mother, exceedingly low. And whatever this small dose is, was probably being destroyed in the infant uh, gut. So probably it's quite uh, safe to use the interferon during breastfeeding, which is the EMA label. But even the monoclonal antibodies, which are heavy molecule, <clears throat> are very low as far as concentration in the breast milk. And we're looking at natalizumab and rituximab. Their ratio in the, uh, the, ratio in the breast milk to, uh, to serum of the mother is less than 1 to 100 and 1 and 240, exceedingly low. And whatever small quantity passes through the milk will definitely be destroyed as a protein in the gut. So again, from this study, they think that yes, it's probably compatible with lactation, to use monoclonal antibody. And we are more and more now prone, especially in patients with highly active disease, to resume this monoclonal antibody immediately postpartum with the, uh, while allowing breastfeeding so that we can gain the breastfeeding advantages while we can protect the mother from any re disease reactivation. So even the concept of breastfeeding and disease modifying therapy is actually changing and evolving with time. So in conclusion, <clears throat> more women with MS are currently conceiving while on disease-modifying therapy, as I mentioned, up to 60%. Pregnancy is associated with the increase, decrease in disease activity during the third trimester, followed by an increase in the postpartum period. However, in patients with active disease controlled on continuous high-efficacy medication, specifically fingolimod and uh, natalizumab, relapse rate might increase during pregnancy, especially with long washout periods. Disease-modifying therapy have different risk profile when used during pregnancy, as I showed, and the protective effect of exclusive breastfeeding is still controversial, but breastfeeding benefit outweighs risk with large molecule DMPs. Thank you very much.